It's a beautiful day. This is going to be the last day for about 60 a week so I can get up and walk around before my surgery, which is tomorrow. I'm not meant to eat much either. I'm actually not supposed to eat until midnight tonight. <sighs> Fuck. Hello. My name is Jimmy Lee Stewart and I'm going to talk about my experience of whenever I had the inguinal hernia and also give you some information about what it was like having it. Whenever you have a hernia, it's basically, uh, a, there's a tear has been formed, a tear has started to form on your abdomen wall and fatty tissue is starting to push out and the inguinal hernia occurs on your pubic bone, your groin, you know, just above the genitalia. And whenever the fatty tissue is coming out, gravity pulls it down, right? And it, for a lot of men, it uh, pokes into your scrotum because that's the closest organ to it. And this will give you sharp pains, which I did have. Not an awful lot, but it did happen every now and then, and it wasn't nice. Mine was caused by uh, coughing. I'm asthmatic and I smoke. I really shouldn't, but I do. And I would cough my lungs out from not taking my inhalers and, of course, uh, inhaling smoke. And over time, because the, I would cough really, really hard, sometimes to the point where my eyes would water or it looked like I was crying when it really wasn't, there'd be tears going down my face. Um, over time, this caused a tear in my abdomen wall. Now, I didn't feel the tear in my abdomen, abdomen, wall, bleh, abdomen wall. I didn't feel it. I just noticed the freaking lump. Keyhole surgery, right? Which basically is a, they make a small cut, a small incision, put a camera inside you, and they're able to see inside your body up on the screen and they're able to use have the utensils and they're able to operate on you and do what they have to do that way look at the screen before keyhole surgery you know in the old days they would just big long cut big long cut uh, just just to get inside you whereas now we don't have to do that incarceration is whenever the hernia is uh, it, it, st it pokes into like, your scrotum and it can't go back out on its own. Uh, strangulation is what, exactly what it says, the tin. That's whenever the hernia gets all tangled up and what can happen there, it can cut off like, your blood supply and all and like you're in deep trouble if that happens to you. Thankfully that didn't happen to me but if that happens to you, you have to go straight to A&E and nine times out of ten when that happens, to my knowledge, you pass out and maybe ex you know, excrement yourself or something like that there. Not very nice. It's actually worse than having surgery. Ingonial hernias are more common in middle-aged men. Men from their 40s, 50s onwards are twice as likely to get them than a woman is. I first noticed the hernia in 2017, around maybe June or so. I just went to the bathroom, used the toilet, standing up, and I looked down and I happened to notice that there was a wee small bulge on my groin. And I thought to myself, is that a cyst? Is that cancer? You know, it's a lump, and usually, you know, whenever you see a swelling on your body anywhere, like typically it's not particularly a good sign. So I went to the GP got it assessed and they're like yep that's a hernia you've got a wee small hernia and it's going to need to be fixed because in the long term it's going to cause you problems it might not be causing you problems right now but it will cause you problems whenever you're walking about and you have an inguinal hernia it's um i realized that if i was to go out drinking you know on a saturday night i would become a lot more fatigued than what I normally would be you know after maybe four or five beers I'd be like you know trying to stay awake and there's times where I, I literally just passed out on the sofa at a friend's house and 
I woke up again. My friends were just looking at me, going, "Are you all right?" You know, because normally whenever I drink, I'm bouncing off the walls, you know, or running around the community. But to see me, like someone that's really hyper, to just sit there and be like just completely out of it, like you know, ready for bed. You know, it was quite a shock because, and the reason that happened is whenever you have a terror in you like that, your body has to work twice as hard to keep you going. You know, because there's a, it's trying to you know keep the heart, blood, and oxygen going, and there's a f couple of holes or so in your body, and even though there's really small holes, that does take a hole. Yeah, that does take a toll on your body. It takes a lot out of you, and you can also have some bowel obstruction. You know, if you were to, you know, excrement, it's. For some people, it's not. It doesn't all come out, or it's painful. You know, it, it's it's not nice. You're not allowed to lift anything heavy, tables, big chairs around the there, because if you lift anything heavy, it can stretch your hernia, and in worst case scenario, it can bust it, and that can lead to death. It can. My GP referred me to get an ultrasound scan. This is the same machine that uh, they use to scan pregnant women so that they can see their unborn babies on a screen. Uh, they carried out that same procedure on me in order to determine the damage that my hernia had caused and what treatment would be required in order to fix it. Before the surgery, they get you to fill out a form, a consent form, that you agree to the surgery. And there's also, like, don't let this put you off if you're going to have, if you're going to have surgery. If I go and have the surgery, seriously, it's worth it. Painful, but worth it. Um, one of the side effects that I remember is that uh, as they're operating on you, because of where the hernia is, there is the possibility that, that you know something could go wrong. They might accidentally, you know, sever your epidermal tube and screw them or they might, you know, do some other damage without meaning to because in going to the area it can, it can be, you know, complicated and it all comes down to the experience of the surgeon that's going to be operating on you. With that in mind, of course, I was nervous about the surgery but you know what, <laughs> you know, if you lose a testicle, you lose a testicle, you know, you only do need one, you only have two in case you do lose the other one. For the actual day of the surgery, I had to do, uh, I think, what it was called fasting, where I wasn't allowed to eat or drink anything for like maybe it was six to eight hours before having the surgery. And the reason for that is so that whenever you go have the anesthesia, there's nothing in your body for you to throw up. Because if you're under anesthesia and if you've drank water right before it, there's a chance that you could end up, you know choking on your own vomit and because you know you're under you can't wake up you're gonna choke <laughs> you know so it, it saves you know you from, it's, it prevents that from happening to you that and on the day of the surgery I went in and uh, of course I was kind of nervous you know they wheeled me in on the uh, the gurney and I plopped myself from the gurney onto the um, bed and one of the other uh, nurses there noticed that uh, I was a bit on edge and reassured me that the surgeon who would be operating on me was doing it, you know, her husband did it for 25 years. And within those 25 years, there's been no um, fatalities or anything. It's been very successful. Uh, so that, that's probably at ease. came to putting the anesthesia inside me and um, they had like a like a needle yeah and they inserted it into my I think it was my arm or it was my I think it was it was around here somewhere they put it in and they got me to count back from no or did they they basically just said um now we're gonna insert the anesthesia three seconds later and now you're gonna go to sleep and um and literally they're, they're, don't don't try to fight it there's no point <laughs> You know, once your eyes shut, that's it. And all I saw was complete blackness. Total blackness. Uh, 
I just had the surgery. I was in a lot of pain. Loads of anesthetics. No morphine. Look at this. Cut me open here. I can't stand up. I'm all wheezy. They gave me so much morphine. I have never been this fucking doped in my life. I wake up, I'm groggy, dope full of freaking anesthesia and morphine because I'm still in my system. Because <laughs> I'm still in my system. And the first thing I asked the staff team, how did it go? And they had me on the gurney back in the ward. And I had the, um, and they're all sitting, they're all standing in front of me, around the bed, uh, to make sure that uh, I would wake up, I'd, I would wake up, you know, and that, that nothing had gone wrong. And the, I asked them how to go, and the doctor said it was a success, success. You know, there's better ways of carrying out the surgery. And even though I had a small incision, a small cut, I was in agony. I was out of breath. I was effing and blinding. I wasn't screaming, but I was just going like, you know, oh my, you know, and thumping, the, you know, the, the, the quilt and all. And I apologised to the nurse, you know, profusively because I didn't, because I, I, it's not in my vocabulary to just swear at people. Like, yes, I do swear. But to swear like that, you know, to somebody, not too sorry, but to swear like that there, you know, in a hospital, you know, I, I felt kind of bad, but then um, she was on Facebook because I realized and she said, I'm not the first one and I will hardly be the last one. So they gave me more morphine and I told her, don't worry about it, you know, don't worry. And she, and she said, no, we cannot have you in pain. We cannot have you suffer like this here. You know, you could be friggin' Dwayne Johnson or Arnold Schwarzenegger. We cannot have you in pain. So they gave me more and then they had to stop. They stopped. I told them, I'm still in pain, it's not as bad. And she said, we can't give you any more, because if we do, you will die. This is beautiful. In order to help the healing, they t the nurses told me every half an hour for 15 minutes, try and walk up and down the ward, the corridors. You know, because it helps, because if you, the more you lie down, the longer it takes for you to recover. So I did that, and you'll see some footage of that here dying. I have an absolute agony there, and that's literally the best I could walk. I couldn't run for one. If I broke in there, run, I friggin' I would have collapsed and fainted there, whatever. You know, I could not have ran. I am literally knackered and I'm in so much pain. But I pushed myself. I was determined, you know, to get myself back out there. I really, really was. You know, I hate sitting down doing nothing. Um, and that very same day, my girlfriend came down to uh, the uh, hospital as well to see how I was. You know, because I put up on my social media stories, I put up my social media stories that I was uh, in the hospital, had surgery. Oh, look at this. Boner is out, you know that. And your girlfriend comes to see you in <laughs> hospital. That's how you do it. I had to go and urinate. So. I got up out of the gurney very slowly, like a very, very old man, a very frail old man. And the nurse helped uh, walk me to the bathroom. And I was wearing one of those, you know them blue, they're kind of like aprons, I can't remember the name of them, but you put them round and, you know, they don't really cover you entirely from behind, but they cover you from the front. So I walked to the, um, the toilet and I didn't even bother closing the door. I, I assumed that the nurse would do that for me. <laughs> and I stood there urinating. And then I turned around, walked back in, and I realized that everybody <laughs> saw my behind. <laughs> you know, and they're all laughing, and I laughed as well. But then I realized, oh, I can't laugh, I can't laugh, don't laugh. Because then um, any movement I did, you know, 
from my stomach, whether it be laughing or coughing, uh, increased the, the intensity of the pain, you know. Um, but I, I didn't, wasn't embarrassed or anything like that, I thought it was hilarious too. I'm sure that's happened all the time. You know, they're used to seeing that there. Whenever I was going to the bed and I got back into it, I all of a sudden felt really, really nauseous and uh, started to sweat quite a lot. And uh, this uh, made the nurses very concerned because usually whenever you have in going down hernia surgery, you're meant to, you know, you should be able to go home on the same day. But for me, I took some kind of reaction to it that I really shouldn't have. And especially given, you know, I'm a young person, you know, well, I'm going to be 30 in February, fuck up. I'm going to be 30 in February, but, you know, the fact that I reacted that way, you know, was a concern. So they kept me in overnight. And the next morning, I noticed that uh, my scrotum was black. And it's swollen twice its size. So I spoke to the nurse about this here. And uh, at this point, I'd been moved to the male surgical ward where they, because um, I wasn't needed in the other surgery ward anymore, the operation's been complete. And I noticed that my uh, scrotum was, uh, it didn't look natural. And I showed that to the nurse and she went and got one of the surgeons who looked at it, examined it, and as he, you know, he had to feel it around, you know, to make sure that the, you know, that in order to figure out what it was, what was wrong with it. And he basically just said, nothing wrong with that, it's grand, it's good, you're alright, you'll be okay. Uh, it doesn't look okay, I didn't particularly feel okay, and then they just sent me home. I don't want to put anybody off if you're going in to have surgery, but I had an infection in my scrotum during the surgery where um, they started to turn black and they had swollen up twice their size to the point where I couldn't sit properly and I got the surgeon to look at it and he was like oh that's fine there's nothing wrong with that there and I was taking pain they prescribed me with painkillers that only uh, a doctor can prescribe you with you can't pick these ones up in the pharmacy or a chemist you can't and as I was going as I went to the GP to get the, um, the prescription the GP decided just to take an ocean and examine me just to see how the progress was going on and was like, oh my, like, what the, like that, that's not good, that's not normal, that's not what they out there. And I said, well that surgeon told me, you know, that was fine. And I thought, and I knew it wasn't fine. And she's like, no, I'm referring you to another hospital, we get seen to a surgeon right now. And turns out it was just an infection, it was nothing, like we thought, you know, is this a clot, you know, or is this like, blood mass, you know, where I might going to lose my balls or something. Um, no, that wasn't the case. And that their doctor, that surgeon insisted that um, I take these antibiotics through the back passage. And I was like, eh, no, no, is there another way? Well, yes, we can have it, uh, you can take them orally, but the reason I insist you have them up the back passage is because they will kill off the infection sooner and will help you heal better. And I, say, and I said to them, I am not sticking anything up there. That is not happening. Okay, I am sorry. That's not happening. I will happily sit another few days of pain if it means I have, don't, have, don't have to put anything up there. You know, so I told him that's, that's my final answer. That's what it's going to be. And he reluctantly agreed. He's like, fine, you're going to suffer more. But, you know, I was like, I'm happy to do that. I'm not putting anything up there. Even though what he was saying, like, it was the most effective treatment. And he was insistent on it. I was like, no. Not doing it. Now, had that been the only option, you know, yes, I would have very reluctantly agreed to it. Yeah, I would have. Because if you don't, you know, it could be, you don't know what that is. Infections aren't particularly good. That could be a life and death scenario. If it was life, if it was life and death, then yes, I would do it. <sighs> I'm out of breath because. I forgot to take the pain colors. I'm home now. <sighs>
point of view, don't take pain towards the pain of the surgery can really take a toll on you. And to get up out of the bed and go and the energy to do it. <sighs> in the car up to my bedroom like a frail old man hunched over and I just uh, by the time I got to my bed and lay down I was flipping you'd think if you'd have seen me coming into my room you'd think I'd have ran a marathon uh, because of how out of breath I was and I, I just lay there I just lay there you know and I couldn't really do much I was able to get my laptop and I just watched Netflix YouTube videos and all that stuff but they, you're really you're, you're not going to be able to do very much after the surgery. You, you really are just going to have to rest. Do get up, walk about every half an hour, and walk. You know to help the healing process. But for the most part, you're just going to be knocked out. Now, I was lucky enough that I was up and walking again within a couple of days. You know, like it was nothing. Uh, for some people, that won't be the case. It'll maybe take them a few weeks or so. Me. Didn't help that I also had some leftover alcohol in my room as well that uh, hadn't finished and I was just like thinking hey, I love level drink right now. It'd be good to have a wee drink. But I didn't want to upset, you know, the, the stitches or the healing process. Oh yeah, I can drink tomorrow if I really want to. Today's the last day of the medication. <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen to you. Infection, you know, it's the same with anything. Like it, it's unlikely to happen. You know, it, it was a result of the surgery.